The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. promises to be a scintillating conversation between my friend Julian Guthrie and Professor McConaughey of uh, UCSD's Rainy School. Uh, I want to first pay some homage to the Women's Center, represented so ably here by Marty Merkelo, who has generously endowed a, a grant to allow us to bring Julian here and sponsor this, as well as a book signing after the event with the UCSD Bookstore. Thank you very much for the support that we have here. So first, we're going to have a few words about this very important uh, picture of UC San Diego uh, called the UCSD Women's Center, which is a part of the division of equity, diversity, inclusion run by another good friend of mine, Becky Pettit, our vice chancellor, one of our fearless vice chancellors. So Barney, please. Hi all, good afternoon. Um, like Brian said, the Women's Center is one of the sponsors of this event and we were really excited when we were approached with the opportunity to participate in this program, to have this conversation about the women featured in the book Alpha Girls. Um, a little bit about the Women's Center. We are part of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here at UC San Diego. We are one of six campus community centers under that office. And at the Women's Center, we focus on providing education, support, awareness around women's and gender equity issues. We serve as a home away from home for students, so we have a community space, a library, a kitchen, a place where folks can just come and be, and then also a space for the whole community to engage with these issues of gender equity. So we're a space for students, staff, faculty, and the larger community. If you haven't visited us, I invite you to come check us out. We are located in the original student center across from Mandeville, and um, I invite you to check out our website as well, women.ucsd.edu. We we have a weekly e-news and that's a great opportunity to stay engaged with issues like this program happening here today as well as other programs happening on campus and in the community. So with that, I'll hand it back to Brian and thank you all for being here tonight. It is a wonderful resource and it's a very, uh, very lovely setting too. I've spent some time there at the, uh, near the Women's Center across from Mandeville, so I encourage people to take advantage of this wonderful resource that UCSD has. Um, the UCSD is known for our uh, um, vast accomplishments in every field of endeavor that we engage in. Uh, I always like to point out that the uh, some of the great speeds that we've had uh, in, in human history and American history have occurred here, and thanks uh, to, to the great women that make up our, our fantastic university, starting with, uh, starting with folks like um, Maria Gebhardt Mayer, who was the founding faculty here at UC San Diego, last woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics, is, you know, I love to point out things like that. Uh, also, Margaret Burbage, who is very much still uh, uh, doing quite well. She lives up in the Bay Area, not too far from Julian. Uh, so she was an original alpha, alpha girl, one of the first presidents of, uh, and first women inductees as astronomers into the National Academy of Sciences. And of course, we had the first female astronaut in America, was one of my colleagues, the late, great Sally Ride. So uh, we have a great history of supporting women, and it's nice to have support of the Women's Center here at UC San Diego. So I didn't mention who I am. That's not super important. I'm Brian Keating, Professor of Physics at UC San Diego. I am the co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, which is the other uh, co-sponsoring entity tonight that got to bring uh, Julian down here for an uh, exposition of her wonderful book called Alpha Girls. I met her about three years ago in her previous book called How, How to Make uh, a Spaceship uh, that really inspired me to want to take on writing projects of my own and she was so gracious and generous with her time. I can't thank her enough. This is just a small way of, of uh, uh, hopefully extending the gratitude that I have and hopefully by you getting to know her phenomenal work, you too will uh, benefit as I have. 
So I want to introduce uh, Professor Uma Karmakar, who is a product, our relationship is a product of the digital age, because uh, five minutes ago was the first time we ever met, and yet she agreed to spend an hour, you know, plus of her time here tonight. So I'm very, uh, great, uh, genera, uh, very gr uh, grateful that she was able to do that. She is an assistant professor at the Rady School. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the School of uh, Global Policy and Strategy, aka GPS. She has a joint appointment with the Rady School of Management, and her research develops theory-driven frameworks about consumer behavior from the brain up. So she's a, a neuro, uh, she has a great deal of neuroscientific influences. Her influences are more than just in economics or policy and things like that. Prior to becoming a professor here, she was a visiting professor at UC Berkeley Haas School of Business and assistant professor in marketing at the Harvard Business School. So it's a great honor to welcome Uma here tonight. And then Julia, you'll hear a great deal of. She is, uh, she is one of the most diversely curious people that I know. She's written about uh, tech and science, but she's been a journalist. She's traveled around the world and will soon be engaging in other endeavors for, uh, for, her, for her projects, including a series adaptation of this book, this wonderful book called Alpha Girls. And I'll just uh, read to you what a very, very distinguished professor of physics once said about this book. Uh, when I was asked as my first, oh, my second blurb, I've given, now I've given five blurbs and only one man has asked me to blurb a book, so I'm very proud of this fact, actually. So I, after reading it and wiping away uh, some, some misty eye tears that I've developed, as I know you will, I said I called it an intimate and addictive homage to the fearless female pioneers who made Silicon Valley blossom. Julian's vivid portrayals of once hidden risk takers and mavericks will leave you heartbroken, but hopeful and hungry for more. And it's truly a, a, a unique book. It's incredibly personal. It's written with a reporter's eye and not just sort of fawning and, and excessive um, platitudes. It's actually really in depth, and I get you'll get the sense of really being with these four remarkable women that you're going to learn more about tonight. So it's a real honor and privilege to welcome both Julian and Uma up to have a conversation with us. Take questions from the audience, and then there'll be a book signing to follow. Thank you. That was a great introduction. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, hi. Hi. Here we are. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello to you. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for making the time this evening. We do appreciate it. And it is certainly very exciting for me to have this opportunity as well. So uh, Julian, you and I have chatted briefly, but I think uh, in many ways I want to start at the beginning. Uh, you do go into this a little bit in the book, but this isn't a, a maybe unusual title or unexpected title um, for such a breadth of experience and, and diversity among these women. What caused you to choose the title Alpha Girls? Um, actually, a couple of women uh, who I was talking with earlier asked the same question. You know, titles are elusive. Titles are very, very difficult. If you've ever had to come up with a two or three word title for a book, it's very difficult. And I had a lot of really bad titles. I had like Wired Women, <laughs> No Way. I had Women of the Valley, which my mom said sounded like some tawdry television show. Um, <laughs> so Alpha Girls, at first I had this idea of the Alpha Girls Club. And then it was like Alpha Girls Club. And then it was just Alpha Girls. I like this juxtaposition of alpha, strong, next to girls. And I think girls of all ages, I consider myself still a girl. When I get together with my friends, I say girlfriends. But I think there needs to be this um, connection between girls and strength. And I, I love that combination in terms of the title. And it's catchy. <laughs> but I really like it. I mean, girls are strong, and girls are creative, and bold, and, and should be embraced for all of these things. But having alpha next to girls um, just made sense to me. And so were these girls people who uh, inspired you to write the book? Did the inspiration for the book, like how did this come about where this topic even raised itself as, as something that was right for now or the right time to approach? I was on tour for How to Make a Spaceship and 
the story about Peter Diamandis and the quest to get to space without the government's help. And I would look out into the room and I would see so few women. And there would be entrepreneurs and engineers and aerospace folks. And I thought, where are all the women in these really critical, dynamic industries that are creating such cool things and such important things? And of course, as a journalist in the Bay Area for so many years, I wasn't oblivious to uh, women in tech and, and the disparities and the gender problems. So I started kind of zeroing in on tech. And then um, I wanted to find a world where there's really this outsized influence that's maybe not well understood, but where women, there are women who have succeeded, but they're the minority. And what does the world look like to them? So then I focused in on venture capital. And when I started, 90, I read some statistics one was 94% of all check writing partners at venture capital firms are men, 94%. So they are investing in the companies that potentially um, you know, shape how we all live. And you don't have this representation among women. So what does that mean? So it also showed me, though, 94% are men, so there are 6%, right, that are women. And who are these women? And what does the world look like to them when they're the only woman at the table, when they're the only woman competing for these deals? Um, how does it look to them? And is it a, is it a, is it a good um, job? Is it an interesting industry? Are they particularly good at it? What happens in their lives when they start adding on as we do when we get older with kids and partners and parents and taking care of um, elders. And so how do they, how do they um, navigate all of that? So it's interesting, too, because I think there are many lenses that you could use to look at Silicon Valley. And while venture capital is a obviously a massive one, it's not necessarily distinct to the valley, whereas some of the technological influences are, was there something about that intersection or something about that location, in addition to being a native, that drew your attention? Again, I think it was just, you know, what I started looking at is, as I got into this story is I started looking across industries at where women are. And I didn't get into it as an activist, but I got into it <clears throat> as a journalist. And journalists want to tell stories that haven't been told. And uh, unfortunately, stories of extraordinary women who played key roles historically have not been told. We have 3,500 years of recorded history, and 0.5% has been dedicated to the stories of women. And I... I was interested in who are some of these women who have helped build some of the foremost companies of our day? Who are they? How did they do it? And why the hell haven't their stories been told? So again, though, it was really getting into it as these, these women who all came to California with this kind of shared dream uh, of making it in an industry that uh, others said was very inhospitable to them, um, yet they love tech, they love venture capital, and again, it's an industry that, in my mind, that if venture capital doesn't diversify, tech won't diversify. So there's this domino effect, and it's like almost the start of the food chain, where you're having $130 billion was deployed by venture capitalists last year. Of that, only 2.5 billion went to women founded firms. So that's 2%. So, and that's pretty, pretty typical. So you're having men writing checks to men, this affinity bias, who look just like them. And what happens when you introduce more women into the equation? So I tell this story through the eyes of these women and in a very novelistic way. So you can follow, you don't have to be interested even in tech. I think you can follow their lives and their journeys and relate to it. I think it's also very eye-opening for men to read. Absolutely, I can imagine. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned that they had this, well, actually, you mentioned several interesting things, so let me pick up on the first, and then we can move to the, the commonalities or differences between these women. The first one, though, that there was a, a, a line that gets drawn but is hard to pin down is the, just the principle, just the idea that if you bring more women into the beginning of that chain, that that, that will 
you know, have, have effects that ripple farther out from that. And you see the efforts that many of these women made to create those ripples. And it's, it's challenging in the larger scope of their careers and the larger scope of the valley to see, you know, how much of that was, was, um, had pushback versus success. I mean, unicorns are unicorns because they're rare. So it's, it's difficult to find that any one firm would do well. There are some successes and some, you know, opportunities for doing better in this book. Do, fr from talking to these women, did they feel that they had, you know, been able to do that? Was that one of their explicit goals or did it sort of arise for them? Like, how did they see their place in, in creating that change, not just in their own companies, but going out into those, the rest of that? tech world? Well, they didn't really see it. It wasn't their um, agenda to get in and change the world for other women. Um, their agenda was they were the only women. They were the onlys. They were the only woman at the table. They were, you know, among the only women in this industry. And so their job was to, like, get their foot in the door, get in, you know, like that Trojan horse um, situation where they had to get in somehow, and then they had to figure out how to make it work, and they had to make really savvy, strategic decisions along the way. So they didn't set out to uh, to make the landscape more hospitable to women, although that is very much what they're doing now. But they had to succeed to show what's possible. You know, the saying, you can't be what you can't see, now you can see it, and you can read it, and hopefully you'll be able to see it on TV. But they were also, you know, women had to, the women of this book had to walk this really thin line of um, fitting in while holding on to their own identity. And, you know, they're surrounded by men and they had to be team players and they had to fit in. Um, they had to network with the guys because the majority of the uh, their peers were men. So along the way, and there just were not these sisterhoods, these women's networks uh, that are uh, thankfully and powerfully um, being formed, created, strengthened in industries far and wide. And it's a very powerful thing that's happening. And it's very necessary. And the women of my book now are uh, you know, you go on this journey with them, but you see them, um, you know, at different points realizing the importance of uh, creating this women's network. And while at the same time, you know, collaborating and working and succeeding with the guys and bringing both to the table, it can't, can't just be a conversation among women. Um, you know, it has to be both you know, genders really, you know, all of the genders coming together with this idea that, okay, if you don't believe in, you know, diversity um, as a, say, moral or um, ethical, you know, imperative, if you don't, for whatever reason, you know, there's the bottom line financially that research shows that uh, companies that have more diversity and the top ranks are more profitable. So, there are many facets to it, but there is this, uh, this, this journey, a very dramatic journey that they all go on toward this realization of the power of um, women coming together and the women's networks. Yeah, you and I have touched on this very, very briefly when we, we first were introduced, but um, <laughs> it is an interesting uh, comparison to some of the other narratives out there. So um, do you think, you know, did the, were these women uh, feeling that that camaraderie was lacking, or were because you have only six percent because they knew they were pathbreakers? Was it something that uh, they didn't even know to want? So uh, a couple of them later in their careers, you know, when they have the opportunities to join these all women groups, approach them with a sense of slight suspicion. Or you know, having been successful and having carved these paths, they're not um, against the idea of this camaraderie or against these sort of women groups, but certainly hesitant about approaching them. And was that more related to the path they experienced, or is it something about the industry that they're in and how uh, dramatic and individualistic venture capitalist ca capitalism can be? I think it's pretty universal for women who work in male-dominated industries. Um, I think it's starting to change, but you still, you know, you're in an industry and there are so, unfortunately, What's stunning is that there are so many industries today that are male-dominated, where 
women at the top levels represent only between 5 and 20 percent of the managers. And so the fact that we're still having this conversation, but what I would say is that so women across industries, whether you're in tech, law, medicine, um, advertising, um, maybe neuroeconomist, as a neuroeconomist, which I'm wowed by her, um, you know, you have to figure out ways to get along with your peers and to network with your peers to advance yourself. So women historically have, in these industries, have not necessarily um, sought out the spotlight because, again, it, it separates them as women, and they were trying to fit in. Um, so now, though, there is this, this prominence of these women's networks, and I think that that really changed, particularly after or was galvanized really by the Me Too movement. Had a lot of, I think that that had a lot of impact on putting the spotlight um, on this in a pretty glaring now is the time way. I mean, the way you phrase it, it almost sounds dangerous to be part of one of those groups too early, right? It sets you apart. Um, there's a there's this sense of like a special interest group as opposed to someone mainstream or part of the central feature. It's an interesting comparison. There's, uh, you know, um, Abby Wambach, the, the soccer player, has written a book called Wolfpack, largely based on her... Uh, one of her commencement speeches at a large university where she discusses this idea of, you know, not just in any one domain, but collectively this is the time at which women start working together at earlier stages. And it, it's an interesting comparison, not because it has a different message from mm -hmm. what I think you're describing, but because from her perspective and coming from a team sport, she wants the team to start early. And as you alluded to, or at least as I'm interpreting your illusion, that you, you're suggesting that um, you know, for these women, coming together too early might have actually prevented them or, or mm -hmm. been seen as, as some kind of um, divisiveness between them and the careers that they wanted to pursue. Right. And I think that uh, Wolfpack... Is an you know it's an interesting story, and I don't think the story of Alpha Girls is a particularly it's not um, it's not contrary to yeah, it's not contrary to Wolfpack, but it's also I mean one of the conclusions that I had out of the book, out of my research, out of really studying these women who figured out ways to succeed, and it was really one step at a time, is that. It's naive to think that you can just catapult yourself into a trailblazing role when you start. We all have to start somewhere, and we have to learn to play by the rules of our industry. Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing, but you can... What these women did so beautifully, and I glommed onto this term called tempered radicals, where they figured out how to work within an industry and figured out what the rules were, what the, you know, what, what uh, they needed to do to succeed while maintaining their own identity and slowly while advancing the causes that are important to them. So I don't think you can just jump in at this trailblazing level and band together you know, with only a group of women and expect to make it work. Um, I think that that, uh, I think that, that is, would be a disservice to... Uh, a young woman uh, who's starting out and thinks that that would work. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there is a step-by-step -step sort of victory that can be achieved where small victories really can add up to something significant. You can go from navigating to pioneering, and that's what these women did, but one step at a time, and it wasn't, wasn't always easy. Oh, so that's certainly clear that there were many challenges, and some of them overlapping in some of them unique. I think what's also interesting here is that, you know, given that you, they, they're pioneering in many more ways than one, right? As you mentioned, you have 6%, and yet the women in this book, while the commonalities might be the love for tech um, and the love the, this this, you know, moving out to the California dream element, they're surprisingly different. There's a surprising amount of diversity in just four individuals here. Do you think that that 
uh, you know, was was helpful in different ways? Do you think it produced unique challenges? Like, we can talk about, um, you know, so many different dimensions of this background, socioeconomic status. There's There are levels of intersectionality here, you know, coming from outside the U.S. versus inside the U.S., being from different races. You know, how much of that put them in independent pathways versus how much of that was was more or less important than something like being a woman or being in a new field? Well, I love the diversity of the women. It's, it's impressive. Um, and people ask me, how did you settle on four main figures uh, for the book? And one thing was I wanted, I wanted, uh, and I wanted these women each to have created, helped build, helped finance, helped mentor uh, a company that was irrefutably theirs, where they took the lead, where... Um, you know, they were the lead investor, they mentored, they stayed with it, they made decisions that saved the company at some point. That company maybe galvanized an industry. So I wanted that. But I also liked that their paths to Silicon Valley were very different. As a couple of examples, we have Magdalena Yashil, who is uh, an immigrant from Istanbul, Turkey, and she comes to California goes to Stanford. She arrives with $43 and nine gold bracelets to her name. And she works the night shift in the computer center. She always wears these. She goes to the secondhand store near, um, near Stanford and she gets these crazy looking costume outfits just so she can entertain herself in the graveyard shift. But she earns her electrical engineering degree um, at Stanford, one of the first women there and jumping ahead, so she becomes this um, serial entrepreneur. She describes her career in kind of funny ways. She's just a great, great woman. Um, as she'll say, oh, I, my career is like a bumper car. She hits a wall and bounces off and finds her way and redirects herself. But she will go on to become this e-commerce guru. At the same time, Jeff Bezos was starting Amazon. She was out there um, named Entrepreneur of the Year. And then she gets to a point in her career where she meets with this uh, hard-charging uh, Oracle young executive named Mark Benioff. Mm -hmm. And she helps him launch this little company called Salesforce.com. Uh, so you have Magdalena, and you see her story, and you have um, Teresa Gao, who her she's the first generation. Her parents moved from Jakarta, Indonesia, to make a better life for Teresa and her younger sister, and she's raised in this kind of redneck, very blue-collar town, and her first job in high school is flipping burgers at Burger King, and she is the first from her town to make it to the Ivy League. She goes to Brown, graduates magna cum laude in engineering, and makes her way west and uh, works, gets her MBA at Stanford. Um, these are all underachievers. But these are actually, <laughs> you know, they're, they're regular. They're, they're, they start out just like the rest of us, you know, but with, with um, advantages and disadvantages. And there were a lot of disadvantages. But they kept at it, and Teresa uh, eventually lands a job at um, at Excel Partners, a venture capital firm, and she goes on to chase down some of the hottest uh, deals in venture history, and and stories really that have never been told in landing Facebook, um, in helping to build big, big, big cybersecurity companies, uh, truly up, bring real estate online. And today, that girl who started out flipping burgers at Burger King, uh, she has a net worth of over $500 million and is called America's most successful female venture capitalist, which she doesn't like that qualifier. No, She's very there. competitive. She's like, well, I compete with men and women. So, But that's just to show their journey that they go on. And the other two women are very different as well, one from uh, the Midwest and an another from the South. Um, so they all land on this canvas, if you will, of Silicon Valley and go on these really interesting drama-filled journeys. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, you mentioned that Magdalena 
describes herself as like a bumper car bouncing. Mm-hmm. From, uh, there are also differences in the style and the way they approach that. So Teresa or, or maybe one of the other women like Sonia or MJ, they, they take those barriers and plow right through them, yeah. right? Like they, they have uh, similar levels of drive, it seems like, and even some similar. Harvard and Stanford are mentioned fairly often in this book. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> so love, ex- similar and levels Brown. of excellent, and Brown and, and, and other amazing universities. Um, uh, they have similar levels of excellence, um, but just it, it leads them again, you know, to very different ways of, of when they hit those barriers, right? Whether it's to find a path around Barrel Street through, or just change directions entirely. Um, you know, do these do these translate into different leadership styles? Like, does that say that those are all options for those, or was it really about the individual and and their journey? Like, are those you know, if we if we look to them for for ins- certainly for inspiration, that part's easy. But for maybe even guidance, does that suggest a range of leadership? I think that um, it suggests a way, this kind of roadmap for. There are different paths to success, of course, but this is one way that these four women succeeded in a very challenging industry, and there are commonalities. And I think it's very instructive and illuminating for women of all ages um, today. And they shared um, a sense of humor that sometimes is lacking in the world today. They use that humor very strategically, very well to uh, diffuse situations that could have escalated, often with men. Um, they were really savvy in knowing when to take issue with something and when to let it go. Um, they were very quantitative. I think women in these industries have to be more quantitative to show their stuff than the guys. Um, so they develop specialties, which is another a uh, great lesson, particularly for women in these industries. Figure out a specialty with Teresa Gao, as I said, it was cybersecurity. With Sonia Perkins, the girl from the, the woman from the South, uh, she really helped finance and build companies that made the internet safer and faster. Um, so develop specialties, sense of humor, works wonders, and uh, thick skin. You know, really <laughs> thick skin. And then, of course, what we all need in life is is find something you love. And they love tech. They love venture capital. And there were the barriers uh, that that they, you know, had to deal with. And they figured ways either around, as you said, or through. They became experts at networking. Um so there were a lot of takeaways. There are a lot of takeaways in the book. Oh, that's for sure. I mean, um, I think it was useful to also recognize, you know, that there there isn't one path. As someone who has a uh, an interdisciplinary background herself, I don't think that's always obvious that there are mm-hmm. different opportunities. I think a lot of you know we see a lot of students here, as you can imagine, and a lot of undergrads. See, you know, and maybe we can add tech as a third pass, but traditionally it was you were a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, even engineer might not have been seen as like mm-hmm. something that led to a career. Um, so that, that mm-hmm. certainly was uh, one of the interesting facets is mm-hmm. the, 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 the different approaches to common problems. Um, you know, given that you had this expertise in some of these industries already, uh, and were able to find these women in the first place. Was there something that really surprised you when you were ge- hearing their stories? I mean, I think at this point we probably could have predicted that there might be challenges for women in an industry like this, particularly in BC at that time. But was there something in particular that stuck out? I think, first of all, that there are these great success stories of women in tech and will it, women in Silicon Valley and that they love it. So you don't hear those stories. Um, I think that Silicon Valley is presented as this place that is teeming with this toxic masculinity. And I think there are pockets of that, but it's also a really phenomenal place for women. And we need more women in that. So that surprised me. Here are these women who have succeeded. Also, here are these women who have helped finance and build some of these, the foremost companies of our day, and we've never heard of them. And what the heck is, you know, what is going on there? So that 
that um, surprised me. I was also surprised by the ridiculous barriers that still exist for women uh, because these women are working in the industry today. So mm-hmm. while the book goes back in time, uh, really starting in the 70s, you know, the women are very much contemporaries and working and persisting. But that that was stunning to me too because as a journalist, I was really privileged to um, work in an industry that was very merit-based mm-hmm. and I did not encounter all of this um, uh, bias or sexism. Uh, it was like Guthrie, go get the story. And it wasn't this, you know, I just didn't experience that. So that was, it was all eye-opening to me. You know, both the successes that you don't hear about mm-hmm. and then the real challenges that exist still for women today, which are, which are um, appalling and surprising um, when you're looking, when you're when you are an outsider, really looking at it, um, it's quite quite stunning. You know, you could argue, or for someone who hadn't had that experience, when you mentioned, you know, it was, it was a merit based thing. That's often the claim that comes out of mm-hmm. more tech or engineering or science disciplines. Um, and certainly, you know, you land a million, multi-million dollar deal. You'd think that that was sufficient evidence of merit, that it might get you some standing. It really does seem like it was, it was constantly, you know, sort of on to the next thing for these women in terms of achieving that level of worth. Did, did you get the impression that they, they had felt that any sense of security along the way? Because many, you know, this, if you read through the stories, there's very little let up in the acceleration that, mm-hmm. that they describe. Is that more because of their drive, or is that more because they felt they couldn't stop? I think it was both. You know, it's a very competitive <clears throat> field, but it's very dynamic, too. And so that's not anything to shy away from. Um, journalism is a very competitive field. I'm sure your field is very competitive as well. I mean, that to me is just a challenge and is part of what makes it great. Um, so I think they push themselves. You know, they push. Th- these were not women who were born, you know, with silver spoons. These were women who uh, had a lot of challenges and uh, wanted to make their own money and make their own careers and be badasses and, um, you know, and then eventually advance um, the playing, even the playing field, and open it up to others. So I think that. Um, you know, it was it was their own it was their own motivation. I mean, you heard a little bit about like Teresa Gao. You know, where where you start and where you get to. You know, that's her own drive. Really, really competitive. Uh, it's a competitive landscape. You can't really let up. It's the you know what's new, what's new, what's coming down the pipeline. But in that way, also very rewarding. I think. That yeah. Sounds amazing. Yeah. So, um, and rewarding financially, and women need to control more of the money. That was so, a really surprising element there, is that yeah. there was the sense that even when they were in charge of the money professionally, mm-hmm. they often had much more traditional structures at home. They did. And that was something they've learned from, too. Like, Teresa tells a story in, um, told me a story that's now in the book about you know, what happens when you're the woman and you are making far more money than your husband? And what happens when you have kids? And how do you juggle this kind of power dynamic, even if it's unspoken? You know, who has the money? Who's making the money? Um, how do you balance things out? And I know a lot of guys would be like, bring it on. That's great. <laughs> but there are also, you know, it creates tension among other marriages. So, um, and Teresa tells this fun story about how she was making all the money. She was making a lot of money, and which, again, is great. We shouldn't, you know, fear making a lot of money because money equals power in a lot of cases. Uh, but Teresa would hide. She had a thing for really great shoes and fancy expensive shoes. Um, But she would hide her purchases in the trunk of her car, her fancy shoes, until her husband was out. And you're like, oh my God, here's a trailblazing magna cum laude uh, woman, you know, trailblazing. And she's 
you know, trying to create more balance, I suppose, in her relationship. And like, if he, if she's giving him, him the money and he's controlling the money and she's hiding her shoes. <laughs> so, um, there, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting path for these women. And money is another thing that becomes complicated for women. You know, if you marry into money, you're a gold digger. If you uh, are after too much money, you know, is that wrong? Um, so this is another industry where women can make a lot of money, and that's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's not about, that's not your primary objective, but uh, you look at the top list, the top 25 uh, people in most successful, i.e. richest in tech, or in hedge funds, or in whatever it is, and they're all men. And, you know, I looked at these lists recently, or athletes, you know, the top 100 uh wealthiest athletes. They're all men. Serena Williams, you know, was there and then she stepped out for a year. So I think that's an important message herein too, that it's okay to want to be in an industry that will also be very lucrative and to control, to write those checks, to be the one writing those checks and making those decisions. I mean, it's interesting because it reflects that on so many different fronts. As you said, you, you have the continuity of having that, um, you know, striving for deals that are ultimately about money and then making that balance at home. There's a, there's a scene in the movie Crazy Rich Asians which evokes the same sort of mentality where the woman who has more money in her relationship hides all of her purchases from her husband who, who came in with less money, has a whole routine with her staff. Oh, that's right. Yeah, uh, and it's you know it's a it's uh, that one's fiction, but but it certainly is not unreasonable <laughs> given that it can happen in the real world. I, you know, it's it's striking that you say that because we see this. So I've taught MBAs at several different schools at this point in time, and uh, and now teach policy students as well. And one of the things that you see is this challenge, even in the classroom, of managing. A, an interest in power, an interest in money, hmm. an interest in things that you're not supposed to want. And technically, you could argue that the, those moral um, perceptions are, are applied to both genders, but realistically, you see that hesitation a little bit more in the women. And then if you don't see that hesitation, it's more marked in the women hmm. than in the men. And so, you know, given that many of these women have MBAs, it's interesting that they had gone through all of those levels of experiences and then gotten to this point and yet still had certain domains where, where this still presented those kinds of challenges. Well, there's this likability bias, right, yeah. where what you're talking about and the more successful a woman is, the less liked she is. And so, you know, it's the right. same with yeah. assertiveness. Uh, it has this inverse kind of uh, effect. So... In that case, you know, if is there is there take are there are there takeaways that we can take in terms of where you know do you have to solve all these problems at once to get ahead? Is it is it possible? You know, where are the where are the most important fronts? Or if you could you know identify some of the things that that these women had that that let them do this? Was it you know resistance to the likability? Because again, they, it's hard to see that translate across the different domains. Is it was it you know at work having one personality and then splitting the personality at home? Like how did they manage or and how do you feel these stories help us learn to manage those different ways of having to deal with different facets of likability or assertiveness or career focus? I think it goes back to this uh, concept of tempered radicals that I've really gravitated to with this story. It's kind of a different model of success for these women um, as, as an example. So Magdalena Yashiel, when she joins a venture capital firm, um, she starts out as an investing partner, and then she makes some great deals and she becomes a, she's offered a job as a general partner. So the, the general partner comes in and says, Magdalena, we, you're doing such a great job. We love you. We want to make you a general partner. And she says, great. What are the terms? And he said, we'll give you 6% carry. That's, you know, how much of the prof, the size of the profit pie, basically, that you're going to get. So she does the math. Okay, there are six partners, whatever it was. And she realized that was not equitable. 
and it was not also what she thought she brought to the table. So she said, thank you, but no thanks. I'm really, I'm fine. I'm happy being an investing partner. I don't need to be a general partner. But she didn't feel, again, it was, it reflected what she was bringing to the table. So she was fine. You know, she believes that, uh, you know, if the, in negotiations that people can tell if you're bluffing. And she was not bluffing. She was perfectly fine. So the general partner walked out. He comes back a couple hours later, and he ups the carry, I think, by 2%. So it, was, it wasn't was a huge amount, but Magdalena said she would graciously accept. It wasn't about being greedy, again, but it was about what she felt she was bringing to the table, what was equitable. Not only that... What sort of standard did it set for other women who might follow? So when she goes in to the glass conference room uh, a week later, the first time as the only woman general partner, on the other side of the glass, all of the assistants, um, secretaries, all women, but they see her in there with the room full of men and they begin to cheer because her win was their win. So that is just, there. the book is full of these examples of how to navigate. You are advancing yourself, but you're also advancing this cause that is important to you, but you're not pushing way beyond something that is doable. So it was 2%. It was somewhat incremental, uh, but it was, a big, it was a big win in other ways. Mm-hmm. And as you noted, and you know, there's, there's this representation as step one type of mentality mm-hmm. in a lot of these fields. It's just coming to the table, um, already gives some kind of role model, you know, and then and then taking that next step is sometimes there's the opportunity to do so, and sometimes there isn't. Um, I think, you know, there 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 there's still all of these challenges. There is still this idea of balancing work and life. And if we're brutally honest, there are plenty of VCs who, like the women in these books, you know, might be on their second marriages, you know, whether they're male or female. Uh, you know, it's an industry that presents a lot of challenges for balancing work and life in general. Um, are, there, are there takeaways that you saw from the way that these women uh, handled it when it worked or when it didn't, in terms of trying to find uh, a, a way that allowed them to do the career that they really enjoyed and was clearly a central core of their lives, but also, you know, somehow incorporate uh, what they wanted to do with the rest of their lives, whether it was children or their relationships or even time off, even the ability to take a vacation, or, or in one case, managing a very, you know, the onset of a very serious disease. Like, mm-hmm. you know, are there are there things that struck you that worked for them? Or or do you see these as just the same challenges that people are constantly still trying to address? Well, while there are four primary figures in the book, there are lots of secondary uh, and tertiary characters, figures as well, women. And one is a woman named Robin Richards Donahoe. And she was, uh, she is partners, venture partners with a legend in uh, venture capital, Bill Draper, wonderful man. Um, and she has four children now, um, but she, in full-time partner, she and Bill were the first to start a venture fund in India. I think it was the first venture fund, actually, that was um, overseas, originated in the U.S. So she was traveling a ton before she had uh, her first child and working around the clock and working weekends. And then when the first child arrives, she has to cut back a little somewhere. But then the second child arrives, and she's like, I can't work. I can't be your only, Bill Draper's only partner and work weekends and work nights. Um, something has to give here, and I don't want to step away. So she, at that point, made the decision so she could stay in the game, she would give up a little bit of her carry. You can tell this is the all important and all important part of venture capital, but to bring in another partner and and not just carry, but the prestige of being Bill Draper's only partner. So she and she was the one who suggested we need to bring in a third partner because I can't work the weekends and kind of around the clock now that we have two kids. 
and then they went on to have four kids, and she is still a uh, venture capitalist and phenomenally successful. So that is, um, that is one thing that she did in a very smart way, keep her foot in the door, uh, give up a little bit, but you know, stay right in there, stay in the game. Um, and then interesting story related to this, and I think this is an important message. This is with Magdalena. Um, the book has not just the successes, but some of the regrets of the women and the missteps. And with Magdalena, it was one thing that she talks about. I mentioned she helped Mark Benioff build Salesforce from idea through IPO. And when, and she had two boys, um, at the time of the IPO, I think that was in 2005 when Salesforce went public, uh, Magdalena, she, again, she had two boys at home, and she missed going to that IPO on the New York Stock Exchange, ringing the bell with or being beside Mark Benioff when he did because one of her boys was homesick. And to this day, she says, I can't even remember which boy it was. I don't know, but I should have, I should have been there. Uh, that you don't always have to be there for your family. Sometimes your career can take precedent, precedent, and that it's okay for women to realize that. An IPO happens once. You've built this company. Uh, you've saved it. You've rescued it during the dot-com crash. An idea of hers you know, was really instrumental. So you should be there. Also, you should have your, those pictures that go out to the world, you know, there, you should be there. So her message, one of her messages is, you know, it's okay uh, sometimes to choose your, uh, your career. And women also have to be really nice to other women and, you know, raise other women up. Don't judge other women for their decisions. But, uh, you know, if, if, Again, Magdalena, she doesn't know which kid was homesick. <laughs> you know, she looks at those photos and she's like, ah, darn, I should have been there. Yeah, that's, that, that can, I mean, given how many hard decisions she had to make, it's, it's interesting that there are ones yeah. that she can identify as the ones that, that really create that regret. Um, but I think those things too, we, you know, hindsight, right? We mm -hmm. learn, it's like, Hmm. In the moment, that seemed right. Your child's home, sick. Okay. Huh. Well. But then, in retrospect, you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, you're in journalism and you're writing. These are not easy fields to be in. Publishing, in general, writing is not an easy field to be in. You could easily define yourself as an alpha girl in your own field. I mean, are there are there takeaways that you? you use yourself or that you would recommend to someone who's, who's at the cusp of, you know, one of these kinds of trajectories? Um, I think that uh, going back to love what you do, you know, find something that you love and stick with it and um, persist. And I, um, you know, I was a journalist, journalist for 20 years and I wrote stories literally sometimes every day. So I wrote every day. I wrote uh, two, my first two and a half books while I was working full time uh, and raising a son. Um, so I did that. You know, I didn't take vacations. If I took vacations, they were, you know, writing vacations. I always had some book or something I was writing on the side, but that's okay because, you know, you achieve something. I set out to achieve something and it's, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard work. So I would not, uh, I would not say otherwise, but man, is it rewarding to create something from nothing to set a goal in life and to get there and, uh, and then to set new goals and to keep going, but love what you do persist. And, you know, I say in terms of my writing, you know, I wrote thousands of probably, you know, I, I figured somewhere probably over 2,200 news stories in my career, and you're bound to get better <laughs> at writing. You do something every day or, you know, consistently, you're going to get really good at it. That's amazing. I mean, um, I, you know, 
how do you and how do they treat some of those failures? So regrets are not quite the same thing as failures, right? Regrets might be that you didn't take the path you chose, but a failure is something that can can stop people in their tracks. And you know, you mentioned you're going to get better. There must have been at least one or two articles in all of those that maybe you don't love or that you didn't think came out the way that you wanted it to. Like, uh, are there are there strategies for dealing with those failures, whether they're externally imposed, right? Like you did the right thing, but it came out wrong. Or, you know, that, that time it just didn't work. You know, you took the risk or they took the risk and it just didn't work. Is there, is there a division that we can draw? Well, I think, um, you know, we all, we all make mistakes. And uh, in journalism, daily journalism, it unfortunately is very on display. So, you know, you would do your best under a really tight deadline. And then you would start getting the emails, you know, ideally not, but maybe, you know, you got this wrong or this. So getting anything wrong is very bad, but it hones your skills. Um, I think that, uh, I think you get better. You know, it's true. It's unfortunate that life is like that, right? That you have to learn, you learn more from mistakes than than from your successes, but it, it changes you and it strengthens you and it makes you better at what you're doing. And that's this also the story of Alpha Girls. I think that's the story of Alpha Girls. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point you make. I mean, we have we have sayings both to some extent in entrepreneurship, but certainly in science, uh, you know, fail early, fail often, and fail hard. Um, what's interesting about both both your your position and the position that these women were in by nature of being in this position was that all of those failures are very public. And, you know, it, it, I think there's an interesting question of whether a public failure is more or less damaging. Like, is just everything amplified if you're unique for some reason, particularly for gender, um, or, or whether or not that, that you know, is, is domain-specific, like it's okay to fail in this way, but, or some of these failures can be private. You know, very fortunately in the lab... It just never gets published. No one gets to see that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas your publications are obviously a little more straight, more uh, public facing, whether whether or not you want them to be. But um, but I think it raises interesting questions about you know what a failure means, and not only to you but to the outside world in in what you're looking for, and and whether that gets amplified. Um, I had I had one question, uh, maybe one or two left for you before we take questions from the audience, who I'm sure. Uh, have their their own um, questions of interest, and that is if we take a step back from some of the specific stories and and uh, and allude to the fact that we're here partially because of the uh, this, this Clark Foundation. Um, many of these women built their fortunes on you know seeing the future in in their own way. So there, you could always talk about internal drive. You can talk about practice, but in addition to risk, they really had foresight in a way that seems unique. And, and impressive and, and critical for the kind of field that they were in. Was it, do you think that this is something that just comes from the individual? Like, does that, can you practice and, and develop this as well? You know, do, do the failures help in discovering then what the successes are? Like, is it possible for, for those of us who might be a little more average to develop that kind of foresight? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was just, it's just training, like journalism is training or medicine is training. Um, I think with these women, you know, they had different strategies. Like some were uh, more interested in what the technology promised and some were more interested in the market for it. So they were on the, you know, on the more consumer side or the more, so it was just a matter of developing again, their specialties. Um, and again, these women were, were very, you know, everyday representational sort of women didn't start out with any special advantages and learn their craft. Sonia Perkins, the woman from the South, you know, she likes to say, if I can become a venture capitalist, anyone can become a venture capitalist. Uh, she was this scrappy kind of entrepreneurial stand type of kid who, you know, started working when she was 12 years old and was working as a busboy in a Chinese restaurant when she was 14. And um, so, you know, again, following what you're, you're naturally or naturally good at or where your instincts take you. Um, but I don't think it requires, you know, special skills. Of course, it helps to have 
uh, business sense, entrepreneurial sense, and technological uh, understanding and interests. Magdalena uh, says she can sum up her career uh, basically by saying one sentence that she has the ability to predict the next anticipate the next technology coming down the pipeline. Now, she doesn't always get the timing right, but uh, it's true. So she, but she's an electrical engineer. So it goes back to, you know, there's, there's kind of a formula here where it's, it's like anything, right? You, like what I was talking about with journalism, step by step. Uh, I'm sure it's what you've done in your career. One thing builds on the next, and that's what these, these women did. No magical powers um, except for the, you know, the enduring traits that we all need, you know, bravery, uh, persistence, resilience, compassion. So they embodied those things as well. I appreciate that you added compassion into that because I think that recognition of the other people, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of these are internally driven. Compassion is one that draws in the outside world as well, and it's it's an impressive, it's impressively demonstrated in these people and in, in a lot of the women who achieve this kind of success. So I understand that you will probably write a book on another topic next. But if you were going to write alpha book girls, either in a different industry or about four other women, you know, you had several inspiring quotes and inspiring women on on the board. Some, you know, who are are current figures, some who are are past figures of note. Uh, would there be, are there particular individuals who either see, think perfectly exemplify this or, or domains where you would really want to explore this given, you know, what you saw in this book in, a, in another field or another individual? I'm hoping to live a very long life <laughs> because there are so many women who should be spotlighted. And, you know, I mean, I could look at any industry I'm interested in sports, in business, in medicine, in law, in uh, home building, in architecture, in where there are, uh, but I can't do it. So that's why women need to, and men need to share, tell, promote the stories of other women. Um, history is just what happens. It's who is telling that story who is recording history, and I feel like, you know, women now need to be in the spotlight. And now I like to say it's not boasting when it's based on fact. So tell your story, base it in fact, and, and help women tell their stories. And that's one of the, the things in terms of break, really compassion now, the women of this book are really leading the charge in raising other women up and opening eyes. And they were very brave in telling very personal stories, um, sometimes of being very hurt, uh, very down, very vulnerable, and knowing that they are still working in this industry. So they were very brave but they're also very compassionate now. They're very, not that they weren't before, but they really want to bring more women into these, you know, into this really dynamic, game-changing industry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, yeah. as you mentioned, the bravery, you know, I said that bravery is more internal and compassion is more external, but quite honestly, the bravery here is external as well as, you, you know, in terms of failures, making those public, you know, that emotional mm -hmm. element what little they had been potentially been able to hide, they were making very public in this mm -hmm. book coming out. So, uh, you know, to allow us to hear the, the completeness of those stories is certainly quite brave. Um, thank you so much for being so candid thank yourself. You. And, you. and again, I, I don't want to take too much of other people's time because uh, what I would love to hear is, or have, have, give these people an opportunity to do is hear the answers to their own questions. So um, perhaps if we can, I don't know if we have a mic for this. We can move along and, and see if there are other questions that, that people may have in the audience based on what you've said or, or what they've heard through the book. I also have plenty of my own questions left, so <laughs> <laughs> totally fine with doing that. And we could turn this on you next. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both so much for being here. So, any questions for both of you, actually? 
So what has been the biggest challenge you've overcome in your careers? Do you want to go first? <laughs> oh, I need time to think about it. You go. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, if we're going to be brave, we can be brave. So um, I was not, my entire career has been interdisciplinary, and the majority of the academic side came from California. So I won't bore you to death with my CV, but I went through nearly every Californian school, and nearly the only thing that could have dragged me out there was an offer from Harvard Business School to be a faculty member there. And we get out there, and I hated it. I loved the people. These, it's an amazing school with amazing people, and it was a very good place for my family, but it just it wasn't the right fit, and that's such a squishy thing, right? Like, why, you know, you don't deserve to be at Harvard? Like, you know, is that vacation? If you don't fit in, is that, did you, did you screw up? Is it because you're not good enough? It's a terrifying thing to admit, and it took me a long time to admit it. There was nothing, I mean, there is nothing wrong <laughs> with that university. And, uh, and so it's clearly got to be me. The problem's got to be me. Um, so uh, so that, that was a real challenge to work through and figure out whether, you know, whether that was okay. Uh, and, and what I, you know, the, the goals of that position and the direction and the, the right way to achieve success there were, wasn't necessarily a good match with some of the things that I wanted to do and some of the ways that I thought I could be the most successful. And uh, accepting and acknowledging that, you know, and let's throw an in intersectionality, particularly when you're Asian, accepting and acknowledging that you might just not be a good fit with the culture at Harvard University <laughs> uh, was very hard. Um, but I think it led me to make choices that uh, overall were, were more productive, were better, and I think uh, coming to the point where I was okay with accepting that what was going to make me, make me successful wasn't necessarily going to be the path that I thought was the one to make me successful was challenging. Um, I'm feeling much better. <laughs> the biggest challenge is that, okay, um, Tom, where you spend your time and the sacrifices that are required. That's always a juggling act and a sense of, um, I've had to cut out a lot of things, a lot of social things. Um, I think I have fewer friends, <laughs> but I have really good ones. Uh, so it's, there's a lot of sacrifice, you know, in, in doing something that is, that you find very, very important and worthwhile. Um, but you have to cut things out. And so that is the challenge of a lot of saying no, but believing that uh, what you're doing is, is worth it. Uh, so that's always a trade. I think that's the biggest challenge that I face. You know, where do you spend your time? Do you spend it with your kids? Do you spend it with your friends? Do you spend it with your parents? What, when this sort of job is so con all consuming? Um, so it's this evaluation of that quite a bit. And I'm pretty relentless in my, um, my writing. How old is your son now? He is, um, he is about to turn 13. So it's very much, yes, in the thick of it. <laughs> <laughs> but fun, wonderful, yeah. But it is, a, you know, it's, it's a time management thing. And, and it's hard, you know, it's, there are a lot of sacrifices. So, but I think that's okay, too, because there's a time for that. And I'm in it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've I got two questions. One is... Do you think it's more of a level playing field now than it was? And what do you or do uh, men in influential positions still have a bias that the women can't perform? That's another question. Yeah, those are good questions. I um, recently read this report uh, that there had been an analysis of. Um, women's pictures versus the men's pictures in on Facebook. Apparently 
of adults get their news on Facebook, which was a revelation to me. But um, it showed that men are, um, anytime there's a story that pertains to finance, economics, uh, leadership, that men are like 49% more likely to be um, in the photo. And then not only that, that uh, men's heads are even bigger in the photos. <laughs> okay, so that may seem random, but um, what it means is that, no, the playing fields are not level at all. And today, you know, that there's more awareness because there are more networks and there's more attention on this subject. But... This is a time I see when it is very much a call to action. Like this has to change with um, every generation, how we think about uh, diversity. Again, I look at the statistics and it is pretty abysmal. Going back to the between 5 to 20% of you know, representation at the top level uh, by women and there's industry after industry, and progress really is not just slowing, it's stalled. So um, there's that side of it, which is very important to realize and to grapple with and to try to affect change. But then there's also this side where there are these powerful um, women's networks and men who are al great allies and also leaders so there are those things happening, too, at kind of unprecedented uh, levels. But, I, but, you know, there's another, I read something just earlier today on um, does diversity, do diversity and inclusion programs work? And apparently they work with those who already believe in diversity and inclusion, <laughs> but they don't work for um, those who hold the power white men. And they don't work because they don't think they're needed. And so that is something that's pretty glaring as well. So there are all these mixed um, kind of indicators, but the main thing is, is that there is, that this is a critical time to affect change. You know, I think about it with my son, you know, raising a son who is aware, you know, that we don't just have personal AI assistants that are women, uh, all across the board. So it's a really, really critical time for this issue. I think you had a question there. Don't forget aviation. Well, aviation I love. And aviation is, you know, um, is you look at the numbers there, and it's far worse than uh, in venture capital. You know, the women number of, are you a woman pilot? It is. That's a, that is another important um, industry. You know, they're like in aerospace now, you have a fantastic leader, Gwen Shotwell, at SpaceX, um, and you have more women getting into uh, rocket science, and, but it's a long way to go. But for some reason, aviation is, is really... And that's also a great, great... I mean, that would be a fantastic career. I'm sure. I'm sure you have stories to tell. <laughs> yes. Um, well, they networked with the guys very well. Um, you know, they again had to decide like what um, what events to go to. You know, some women will avoid the Las Vegas boondoggles because of you know the the appearance of 
uh, something being off, but these women had to network with the guys. Um, also, you know, there's one scene in the book where Sonia um, is at the Banky Boondoggle in Sun Valley, and she's been invited by this famous um, hard-charging investment banker, Tom Weissel. And um, she's in the lodge, and she's enjoying her lunch, and she's like loves après ski more than actually skiing. And he comes up, and he says he signed her up for the downhill ski race that afternoon. She's like, you know, has this great poker face, but she was one of the only women invited to the conference, and, you know, he's surrounded by his posse of guys, and she skied maybe six times in her life, but, uh, but she gets out there, you know, out on this, you know, steep hill. It's literally, they've set up flags, so they have this shoot-like run, and she describes that she was feeling very much like uh, the Grinch's dog, Max, looking over the snowy <laughs> precipice. And fearing this was not going to end well, but she made it down the hill safely. She has this uh, phrase called, she calls, she says, obstacles are my allies. And that kind of got her through a lot in her career where she had these obstacles. But so anyway, she made it down the hill and the Weissel was there, thumbs up and with his buddies. And that night at the, at the table, you know, the coveted seat in the house, the, the sharp elbowed investment bankers would be jockeying for this position was to be seated to Weissel's right. You know, they would try to rearrange the tags and anyway, and she was seated there that night. So, um, so that was a case where she was just a part of, you know, a part of what was going on, the networking. Um, but I also think now join in these women's networking groups because do both because the women's networking groups are also really fantastic, really powerful and um, a lot of fun. So I, I would I would suggest doing both seeking women um and and making sure that um, you're a part of the team. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Go ahead. Um, so as a journalist, I'm sure you're very familiar with editing and cutting and stuff like that. Um, are there any fun anecdotes or cool messages or anything that didn't make it into the book but you still think is, uh, is nice to tell? There was there were several what I thought were very, very, very personal. Maybe they were too personal. So there were some scenes like that that I had reported out and that I, I took out um, of the book. There were things with um, their family life where there were more personal stories that for the sake of the partners or um, the husbands, I kind of tempered a little bit. Um, and I think that's fine. You know, this, it, it got their, their stories and their honest stories. Um, but I think, no, I'm, I'm really, um, there was this boondoggle that the women went on and went went to in Hawaii. It was one of the few women's get-togethers, um, and I included that. But there were a lot more really fun stories within that scene. But I think the scene was going on for too long, mm -hmm. so it's just a matter of pruning back. I don't feel like I lost um, anything super important. I fought for some scenes to stay in that were not directly about um, these women, even, but were about inside venture capital, like how Skype was funded um, and what happened as the venture, as these people were chasing down that deal, and what it's like to try to deal with very elusive founders, as you had with Skype uh, in the earliest days, and when those Skype founders were. You know, you had to sign a non-disclosure. You couldn't even reveal where they were because they were wanted in, uh, in the United States. And they would, like, hide under tables anytime you went. So there were fun scenes that I included that I had to kind of fight for because I thought they were 
really interesting bringing you inside this industry. I didn't lose. I've gotten to the point in my, my career where um, I will really fight for scenes that I think are really important. Um, so I didn't lose much, but no one's ever asked me that question. It was a good one. Thank you. <laughs> yes. When you were um, conceptualizing writing cocktails and you found the cocktail women um, who were who were willing to tell their stories, can you talk to us about those who did not? I interviewed a ton of men and women, and. There was no one who, um, there was one woman who um, didn't participate just because she's writing her own book, um, Eileen Lee, who's great, venture capitalist, and she is a founding member of this uh, really wonderful all women's, it's kind of the political arm, it's called All Rays. Um, but everybody else, you know, was, there wasn't anyone I went after who I didn't get. Yeah. I'm very persistent. No does not mean no. It means come at it from a different direction. <laughs> yes? Hi, thanks. Um, I guess I'm interested more on the part of the title that says how they made a deal with their lives and wanted to be in venture capital and coming from a different side, science and other things, um, and a trajectory through six years of startups to join communities and help to learn and be inclusive is a really big thing in San Diego specifically, a lot of the diversity things going on here. But now I'm also trying to navigate how to start making those deals to actually launch a career, actually to get paid, actually to find money in the industry. And a lot of my friends and a lot of the groups are just volunteer based, and this is getting the word out, and this is getting people aligned. So do you have any tips or things that I'll be able to find in here that kind of show how to go and not look like I'm the only one trying to make money on this to launch a career? <laughs> well, come to Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> I say it's coming here, so I want to get it. Okay. Um, you know, I would go to networking events, um, VC events, and, you know, I don't know if you're applying for jobs at these places, but um, it's not all about making money, but, you know, a lot of people get into it because, again, you can make a lot of money. So I would, um, you know, first I'd start reaching out to some of these women I'm talking about, like the women of the book, the women's venture groups, um, you know, All Rays, uh, Broadway Angels, Plum Alley, you know, really look into just Google women venture groups, women investing platforms, and because women are trying to bring more women in, so that could be a place to start. And some of the women of Alpha Girls are, you know, very strong leaders in that. So I would reach out directly, um, you know, with your credentials, with what your interest is, um, and, and take it from there. Because also, you know, firms that are um, predominantly male, most firms, um, are looking to bring more women in to the ranks. So actually now is a very auspicious time for women getting into venture. sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.